Isn't that a nice sound? It's a great sound. There it is. Mm. Mm. Hello, I'm Anna. And I'm Al. Hello. And welcome to Anna and Al's big Portuguese wine adventure. We used to have proper jobs. I was a foreign correspondent and Anna was a diplomat. But we decided to give up all the globetrotting to move here. Southwestern Portugal. It's so beautifully quiet and peaceful here. The view over the forest and the mountains is just stunning. Yeah, Alentejo is this landscape of rolling hills, cork oaks and olive groves. My dad's family is from Alentejo, but further inland. Here, we're closer to the ocean. When we moved here, we found those scraggy vines just over there by the fruit trees. About, what, 20 of them? They must be pretty old. They're on a slope at the edge of a terrace, and they're a complete mess. Totally overgrown with brambles, and I've no idea what kind of grapes they are. Our lovely friend Baptiste, who happens to own a real wine estate in France, kindly called these little things a not unmanageable parcel. <laughs> yeah, he did. But it did get us thinking. Maybe we could plant our own grapes and make our own wine, down here or up on the flat land on top of the hill. So after decades on the road, we're finally putting down some roots. Literally, as well as figuratively. <laughs> but first, we have so much to learn about wine, especially Portuguese wine. Which is why we're going on a big adventure, to learn as much as we can. And rather than keeping it all to ourselves, we thought you might like to join us. At least we know a few of the basics. P is for port. V is for Vinho Verde. T is for Turiga Nacional. A is for Aragonese. But I'm getting ahead of myself. There are very few places in the world where you can buy such good value wine. And so many are now getting noticed around the world. Remember the wine merchant we met in California? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. He told us that compared to other European countries, you can't buy that quality at this price, whether you want fine wine or value for money vino. In each episode, we'll go to a different vineyard in Portugal, go behind the scenes, hear the maverick winemakers tell some great stories as we ask stupid questions so you don't have to. <laughs> If you're as curious about Portuguese wine as we are, with a bit of history and exploring on the side, then you've come to the right place. So welcome to NNL's Big Portuguese Wine Adventure. Episode 1. Vineyard 1. Vicentino. So there they are, fields of dormant vines waiting for the perfect temperature to burst into life. Yeah, Vicentino Vineyard is just 20 minutes from our house and it's a great story to start us off. In this episode, we'll learn the connection between French grapes, cat pea and the beetles. Yeah, and we'll try drinking Pinot Noir naked. We will? <laughs> yeah, you'll see. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll develop some serious secateur envy. And there's a strong Scandinavian connection. My name is Ole Martin Siem. Uh -huh. I'm a Norwegian, and I came out here for the 34, five years ago for the first time. And been building up this farm where we are standing from scratch. And I didn't think of wine before 2007. Wow, you didn't think about wine before then? Well, I consumed wine, I enjoyed wine, but not gave it any thought of producing wine. So what was the business to start with? Frupo is the name of the company. We are vegetables and decorative foliage, which is... Leaves you never ask for, but you get when you buy flowers. <laughs> okay. And wine was on my desk many times, but I said, it's so competitive, there's so many doing it, it's so different from what we are doing. So I said, no, 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 no. Until I read that good wine is all about producing good grapes. So I said, well, we are good growers, we are professional on growing. 
So I started reading more and found out obviously that we are in a very special terroir compared to the rest of Alentejo because we are so close to the sea. So the temperatures are much lower in the summertime. It's milder in the winter, but lower in the summertime. So I uh, thought maybe we can be different enough to stand out in the marketplace and have a chance to do something special. And the first plants were planted in 2007. Is that when you came in uh, or have you been a later addition to the business? I joined recently. I'm Philip Caetano. That's my name. I'm Portuguese. And I, I joined to be the head of the wine business. All right. Well, let's have a little tour then, shall we? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Do you have the keys? In the car. They now have 60 hectares of grapes on this flat strip of land on the edge of the world. Yeah, that's what it feels like. The cliffs on this wild coast are rugged and steep. You go in the front, and we'll, we'll both go in the back. Oh, OK. <laughs> this vineyard is a bit of a frontier for winemaking. Most of Alentejo's grapes are grown far inland, where it's super hot in the summer, totally different from this seaside climate, which is similar to the Californian coast or parts of South Africa. And that had a lot to do with Ole Martin's decision-making. Yeah. Great. This is for Riga Nacional on the left. Uh -huh. okay. And the Sauvignon Blanc on the right. Okay. Why did you choose to um, put Sauvignon Blanc in, first of all? Because we are close to the sea. I love Sauvignon Blanc. It's a good reason in itself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought it was a good grape that would thrive well here. And uh, I was proven right, I would say, after these years. It's uh, our best seller and it was launched in 2015. And it went right onto the top, I would say. Uh, our winemaker was the the winemaker of the year. And the Michelin star restaurant all wanted it on their list. So that was a good start. <laughs> it certainly <laughs> was. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Can we jump out yeah. and yeah. talk about it? So this is the Turiga Nacional. It's an indigenous grape to, uh, to Portugal, isn't yeah, it? Turiga Nacional is a red grape uh, and it is very Portuguese. And it's, I would say, the national grape of Portugal. On the you agree reds. with me? On the on reds, the reds yeah. 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 And um, uh, it is uh, a Merlot, very nice grape. It's uh, a bit forceful, grown in the interior. It's very forceful wine, heavy full of uh, all aromas. Uh, down here at the sea, we get it slightly more elegant, uh, meaning less forceful. Ole Martin is a bit of a maverick. He comes from a big Norwegian shipping family, but took himself out here in the 1980s, before Portugal joined the European Union, to develop a farm. And as he did then, he's now doing something very different in terms of winemaking for Alentejo. So basically, we have some um, Sauvignon Blanc going uh, south mm -hmm. all the way, continuous on the other side of the road. Whereas these lots here, we have Turiga Nacional, Semelio Blanc, mm -hmm. and Aragonesh. Another Portuguese. Yeah, other Portuguese. And then we have some Syrah, mm -hmm. and we have some Pinot Noir, as we talked about. And we have uh, Alvorinho, which you see just across there, which That's is uh, the other white. Portuguese. Portuguese yeah. white, isn't it? Yeah. And on top of that, we have Arinto. Mm -hmm. Lately, we have Chardonnay. Obviously, Chardonnay is a, a little story I can tell you afterwards. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pinot Noir is another non-Portuguese grape. Mm -hmm. Also, a uh, uh, wine I, I loved. And we are the biggest Pinot Noir growers in Portugal today. But the thinking here was also that we are in a cooler climate in the summertime, and the Pinot Noir is very picky in terms of the soil, the climate, and the farmer. You know, if you don't give it a lot of love and care, it will not deliver. Let's take a few minutes to have a wonder. Let's check out what this area is famous for. We can't just talk about wine. I mean, you need to get a feeling for the place and this beautiful stretch of coastline. Wow, isn't this amazing? This is so gorgeous. So here it is. This is the Atlantic coast. This is what uh, makes the Vicentino wine so special. Yeah, it's a beautiful stretch of coast. The idea is that every time we go to a vineyard, we're going to go for a wander and give you a bit of a sense of what it's like around and about. Paint a picture, if you like, to get a sense of the place. 
And here that's really, really easy. I mean, we're walking along the Fisherman's Trail on Rota Vicentina, uh, which is on the Vicentine coast and uh, stones throw away from the vineyard. Yeah, it's beautiful how the Atlantic crashes into these cliffs here. It's very dramatic. Look, this natural park is totally unspoiled. The surfers just love it here. And there's some pretty good seafood to be had. Yeah, I mean, I've been dabbling with fishing, but not very seriously. But you often see the fishermen perched on these steep cliffs, casting from the cliffs into the ocean below. I mean, we love this coast. It's so beautiful. And even in the high season, you can find yourself a little secret beach with practically nobody else on it. Yeah, I love the geology. Just the, the way the rocks are all folded and twisted. I'd love to know what caused this millions of years ago. This is very lovely. We're just uh, walking through some shady trees over a path which runs next to a creek which you might be hearing in the background. And yes. We're also flanked by gorgeous, almost bamboo thick kanash or reeds. What's up, Mata? How are you? We found you. Alistair, hi, nice hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you too. We're already recording? Yeah, why not? This is Anna. Hello. Hello. Hi. hi, pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you too. My name is Marta Cabral. I am the president of the association Rota Vicentina, which manages all the trails connected to Rota Vicentina. This place was for thousands of years, a very special, even mystical place. Because, you know, it's over 100 kilometers of wild coast and it's really amazing. This is a big part, but for me, that's only the Instagram effect of it, in the sense that there is so much more to live here apart from the landscapes. Vicentino, just uh, behind us, obviously almost share a name with you. Tell me about that relationship. Yes, wine is an amazing asset from us Portuguese people. This area is not very traditional for local wines. You know, people produce the wines for their own house or for the neighbors. There are not many local good labels and okay, this is one of them. So they are our partners, in fact. Marta, thank you very much indeed. And speaking of labels, I think Vicentino wines have done a stellar job of capturing the colors of this coast. All of their labels are beautifully stylized, modern, but in various shades of blue and pink, depending on which time of day they represent. It really is a, uh, a special part of the world, isn't it? It is for us to come to and hike and walk our dogs. But for Ole Martin, it's even more special. He's even more impressed by the land and what it has to offer. You said that the, the terroir here was particularly special. What is it about the terroir here? Oh. Not just the being so close, I can see the ocean from here, actually. Yes, just peeping can, over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah just yeah, there, isn't yeah, it? Very yeah, close. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful coastline. But what is it about the land? Well, how many hours do I have? <laughs> <laughs> can you do the short version? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, this terroir is, is unique. And if you look at a Google map and you look at Portugal, you see this green triangle. Uh -huh. From just north of here into the mountains, Montchic, and then back out just north of uh, Sagres. Oh, so it goes right down from here in Alentejo down yeah. to the Algarve, yeah. exactly. which is very close. And are there many other winemakers in that triangle? No, there isn't, mm. for now. I think there will be more as we go uh, in, yeah. into time. However, because this has, if, if you go further north along the coast, you don't have the same microclimate. Mm -hmm. Here you have a certain wind pattern that mm -hmm. brings in fresh air from the ocean mm -hmm. and sends it in and it goes back out uh, around Sagres, uh, which cools down the summer temperature. And that's very important. When you have 43 degrees in Beja, we will typically have around 30, maybe even less, 28 degrees, which is perfect for the grapes. The other possible thing is the, the fog. Yeah, that we the, have. the marine layer. That's what made me think uh, about um, 
about California and yes. uh, having that marine layer that comes in. It's quite common that we have it even during uh, summer, that we yeah. have it till 11 a.m. Mm. many days. And that's good for that's the grapes. That's good for the grapes, yes. Excellent. This is why these grapes that, uh, that were chosen um, are so well implanted here, because it's a quite, quite mild climate, or microclimate, as we were talking, compared specifically to the interior of Valentejo, where you find really hot and high temperatures. And here it allows for these specific grapes to ripe very, very slowly. Yeah. And that's very important for the, for the final result, obviously. This is only the first chapter of 10 describing the speciality of this green <laughs> triangle. <laughs> is it? Okay. And this triangle is marked by the Meniere rocks, 6,000 years old. It's a monolith. It looks like a gigantic tooth. There are quite a few, 25 or thereabouts. Oh. And they actually follow more or less this triangle. And the layers of Portuguese history have been piling up ever since then. The perfect chance for us to take a clink and a think about the past. In terms of winemaking, that probably started here around 800 BC with the Phoenicians. Then the Romans spent centuries taking it to another level with their amphorae and cultivation techniques. And the Christians that followed were big fans of wine. Not so much the Moors, who invaded from North Africa in 711 AD. Portugal was under Islamic rule for 450 years. There are thousands of Arabic words in the Portuguese language. And Algarve, meaning the West, is where the name Algarve comes from. The Christian crusaders drove the Moors out, and wine has played a pretty important role here ever since. How long have you had the Chardonnay? And then, obviously, younger looking. Yes, uh, they were planted in 2000 and... Uh, 16, 16 and 17. Yeah, 16 yep. and 17. Oh. I've been skeptical on the, the growing Chardonnay here in Portugal. My favorite wine is a good Chardonnay, mm -hmm. and it's the wine I dislike the most as well, and it's a bad Chardonnay. <laughs> when it's really buttery and oaky. Yeah, you heard about the expression in the United States, for instance, uh, when you're asked what wine do you like, and you say A, B, C. It stands for anything but Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's a lot of truth in that if it's oaked and buttery yeah. and too much fruit and you know it's yeah, yeah. Uh, a little nose is sufficient. I have some French friends. We're friends with Henri Boulon. Uh -huh. I call him the Beatles in the wine world. You know uh -huh. he in fourth fifth generation produced excellent wines in the best part of Burgundy. Uh -huh. They convinced him to come out and visit. And for him, you know, any wine outside Burgundy is nothing, and particularly Sauvignon Blanc, that's like cat pee. <laughs> and uh, as most French, and in particular for Burgundy, it's a bit snobbish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, coming out here to Portugal, seeing what was going on, he got everything confirmed. This is an area outside the area. It's, you know, it's the wildness. Yeah. He got here and we served him Souvenir Blanc yeah. from around 2014, in fact. And he said, this is not Souvenir Blanc, this is different. Huh? Souvenir Blanc produced here. And he said he liked it. That just means so much to me because people are polite and say this was a nice one. But when you finish two bottles, I understand he liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and if he didn't, he probably would have said. Yeah. He's one of those people who probably yeah, yeah. would have said. He, he, he's, he's one of the guys who would have said. Yeah, he didn't spat out. However, the following morning, he said, we need a, a digger to go and make some profiles in the ground here. Mm. So he dug up 10 different profiles down to three meters. And for each hole that we dug, his mouth goes more and more open. And he says, this is fascinating. Look at this profile. Look at the soil and the geology and the mixture of rocks, etc., etc." And then he said, if you allow me, I'll provide my plants for one hectare and I will follow it up in seven years. Really? And okay. for me, that was like, you just learned to play the guitar. And then Beatles come and says, should we make a record together? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's amazing. It's and this amazing. is it? And this is it. This hectare here is only uh, Ballon's uh, grapes. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's 
<laughs> fantastic story. Wow, <laughs> this just gets better and better. <laughs> so now you have, uh, yeah, Burgundy is now closer to the Atlantic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the 19 was the first time that we had the possibility to, to bottle. Yeah. And uh, we're not launching it now because we need to, to see how it progresses, but the first tastings are really, really amazing. I can sort of see your, your mouth visibly watering yeah, as you're talking exactly. about your Chardonnay. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Literally, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as well as learning about Portuguese wine, we're also learning how to make the stuff. And that means planting vines, growing grapes, and then looking after them. Yeah, I'll leave, leave this one here as a... As a spera, two pump, cut, and cut this one. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to turn down a chance to learn about pruning. Mm -hmm. You mean how to tackle our overgrown vines? Well, yeah, I mean, when they offered to introduce us to George the pruning guy. Can't say no, right? Exactly. And you got secateur envy, didn't you? Absolutely. I need the electric secateurs. So my name is uh, Jorge Martins. I'm the viticulture manager of Rupor and Vicentino. Mm -hmm. And we are now in the field where we are pruning Sauvignon Blanc. It looks pretty brutal, must be said. <laughs> it is, it is, well, basically, the way we prune will indicate the way we want the plants to, to grow and to produce. So we can define, let's say, the architecture of the plant. Uh, we can uh, prune the, the plant to produce more and to produce less. And be, because of that, uh, as well, there's a direct linking between uh, wine quality and production. So this vine, this uh, you, this is Sauvignon Blanc, you say? Yep. And it branches off from um, uh, a main root, a yes. stem, which is about, what's that, three quarters of a metre from the ground? Yes, yes, more or less. So it basically has one, um, one main uh, foot. We leave the main branch of, of the main arm that we put last year, and then we just select one, two, three, four canes, where we cut them and we just leave these new growth areas. I'm looking at all the people pruning and mm. they're working super fast. How long does it take to prune uh, like a hectare? One hectare? Yeah. Depends of the type of pruning. What they are doing now is uh, one of the most simple pruning mm. systems. So I think more or less it's uh, one day per one hectare on this system. And we couldn't pass up a chance to ask for a little advice about our um, parcel. <laughs> yeah, but he wasn't very impressed with your photos of the vines, was he? So, I took these the other day. Here we go. They're terrible colour. <laughs> uh, they're rubbish photographs. And they all look like this. They've got no Sorry? irrigation coming into them. Right, this is a bit wild, huh? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Huh? Obviously, we have no idea, we have what, no they idea what they are. <laughs> right. No idea. There were some grapes on them last year. Ah, oh, that's that will produce uh, incredible <laughs> bottles of wine. <laughs> <laughs> of course, no, no. We just, we just. So we do want to plant like a third of a hectare right. of grapes of some description in the future. But I just thought, what I should do with them? I should prune them, so at least you when should. they come you up... You should. No, I mean, at least you have some grapes. Something to experiment with, exactly. to see how Definitely. they grow, Definitely. and, you know, just to learn, really. Definitely. But Any the, idea what it is? It's difficult to understand the, <laughs> the way it's been done in the past. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> what a mess! Yeah. This is all the Martin, uh, all the Martin house. This is house, that's yeah, lovely, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Beautiful. Yeah, nice. Lake and it's like a paradise almost. It is. Fantastic. Okay, okay. Bye -bye. Bye. thank you very nice much. Nice to meet you. Oh, Thanks oh, for your oh, time, George. Hello. Hello. How are you? Such a gorgeous house. Yeah, this is uh oh, stunning. What are we tasting today? What are you... Uh, we have some shellfish. Mm. Yeah, some uh, oysters. fresh oysters and some clams. And we'll have some tamburil rice, mm, which is uh, monkfish rice, I yeah. guess, in English. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we'll serve you some rosés and uh, some white wine. That looks like a chardonnay, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then we can have three different... Uh, yeah, okay. Pinot noirs. Pinot noirs. Yeah, 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 fantastic. Yeah, that'd be really yes. great. So we have a 100% Pinot Noir, and it's a rosy, 
<laughs> so it's a very uh, light and pale salmon pink, rosé. This one aged on barrels. When the grapes arrive, they are very, 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 very gently crushed because we get the first, what we call the first juice. Mm -hmm. And this is the one that goes into this wine. So it's very, not only the grapes are chosen almost, you know, bunch by bunch, mm -hmm. at the winery they really have extra care if you want on the pressing. Taste is something that we are not educated from childhood. I could point at your sweater, your shirt, and say exactly the color. It's not blue, it's slightly turquoise or ocean blue. You have words to describe down to the smallest detail. But we never learn that in taste. But it's the same kind of organ that you can develop and you can have words and you can recognize and you can remember. Like I will remember your shirt being ocean blue, for instance. You can remember, ah, oh, the wine I drank five years ago had this particular taste. But it's also the way to organize the, um, the different taste in your brain. So it's as much that as to actually taste. Educating your nose to recognize and separate different basic smells and taste, if you like. And the vocabulary is enormous. You can talk about everything from leather and earth to <laughs> flower and fruit and perfume and what have you. So that's the tasting part of it. And then you have more the texture. You have wines that are more fatty, more rich, if you like. Uh, and then you have a third aspect. You have the acidity. And uh, that's... By and large, uh, the wine is better the more acid, even in red wines. A lot of people will say, oh, the wine tasting thing, it's just wine snobs. They talk about all these flowery yeah. language. Yeah. But I, I guess we're learning it's a way of, of sharing a palate, uh, sharing um, how you describe blue, mm. how you describe a taste is, mm. is very difficult, playing off what you've just said about mm. people not knowing how to describe what that flavor is. That's why they say it's snobbish, because they don't understand. It's like somebody talking about the painting. The more you know, the more you can appreciate, and the more you see in that painting, and the more you like to talk and share <laughs> with others as well. Same thing with a glass of wine. It's the more you know, uh, the more you understand, the more interesting it is to analyze it and enjoy it and also share your opinions. So, on that, so, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you can smell and what you can taste. Yes, let's uh, smell it first. I forgot to talk about the saltiness that we have in this area. Yeah. And uh, the first thing that comes to my nose when I put my nose into the glass is that very fine saltiness mm -hmm. that is very present. And then, uh, obviously, you recognize at least the, the Pinot Noir uh, grape, which is the, the slight fruitiness of the Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And it uh, triggers my nose, so I would like to taste, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Stage two. <laughs> <laughs> and it is simply... Wonderful. <laughs> it has this, you know, it's not short, it's not too rich, it has this fantastic balance. I, I, in particular, this one, I think it's a beautifully balanced Pinot Noir Rosé wine. Thank you very much indeed for the tour of the vineyard yesterday, for this fabulous lunch and the tastings, particularly the, the Pinot Noirs. For all of your time and all of the wonderful insights that we have gained from you, thank you so much. And thank you so much for listening to our first podcast. If you liked it, tell all your friends. If you hated it, don't tell anyone. Thanks to Vicentina Wines and Ole Martin CM in particular for hosting us 
and showing us around. And giving us a lovely lunch with lots of wine. Thanks, Rota Vicentina. And to all of our guests. Share us, like us. Love us. Encourage us. And please listen to the next episode when we get down to some serious business. We're heading to big, bold Alentejo red wine country. To boldly go where you might not have gone before. And to follow us on our big Portuguese wine adventure. Oh, you can do better than that. Our big Portuguese wine adventure! Thank you.